welcome to the worst talk you will ever see. All right, I'm John. That's my proof. The uh, fluffy ball of fur on the right is Oscar. He's how I rub a duck program, but with a rabbit. Uh, you can find me on Twitter on the handle in the bottom right. Please follow me. It's how I judge my worth as a person. By day, I lead security and infrastructure over at Orbit, where I am currently hiring SREs and security engineers. So if I haven't scared you off by the end of this talk, please come and say hi. Uh, by night, I do acting professionally. Uh, occasionally, I uh, moonlight as a stage pyrotechnician, and I'm in the process of gaining my private pilot's license. Um, and all of those things involve breaking things to some degree or another. Um, and I do a lot of talks like these, mostly due to the fact that I have a bit of a knack for finding bad, bad things, uh, and it's always fun to talk about them. Uh, I've seen basically everything from perfectly designed functional code to things I'm pretty sure have at some point opened unstoppable portals to the underworld. Um, so I have categorized some of them for you in what I can only describe as a compendium of awful, uh, with the goal of... Oh, first, quick disclaimer, I am not representing my employer. Some of the photos and stuff in this talk may not be my own. Please don't sue me if you accidentally set yourself on fire during the course of this presentation. Um, the usual. So, let's have a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to discuss why the security community has failed in the past. I'm going to discuss why the security community is failing in the present. I'm going to discuss why the security community will fail in the future. Point being is that security is horrible, and I'm going to tell you why, because I love you. And if my parents' divorce taught me anything, it's that when you love someone, you tell them horrible things and then leave them for someone younger. So, we are going to be primarily learning through fail, meaning I'm going to explain what a thing is. I'm going, then going to explain why that thing caused another thing to tie a horrible, fiery death. Because as much as we love to give lovely, fluffy talks explaining how we do things by be best practices, we don't often talk about when we do things wrong. Um, as an example, you may think this is uh, a nice pun. You are a cute tea pie. Um, I, in a chain of events that resulted in a very awkward conversation, interpreted this as you are narrow, scolding, and irrational. And the goal here is basically to help you out by process of elimination. Uh, so instead of explaining what the cool new IETF approved way to do things is, if I show you what not to do, uh, in theory, that should help narrow down what we should do. And also because if you can't laugh at yourself, like, laugh at other people, seriously. So, we're going to talk about how light bulbs can spy on your home. We're going to talk about why all your work doors basically have no locks because of bad user sanitation. We're going to talk about how you can make certain brands of Wi-Fi router just give you their password over text message. We're going to talk about how your car is fundamentally designed to kill you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, this car, apparently, has murdered at least 14 people. How? I have absolutely no idea, but... Uh, we're going to talk about Uzbekistan, for some reason. Um, we're going to talk about how printers are just shit. Um, and we're going to close off with a quick refresher on why you should never trust trains. There will be no therapy provided. Uh, people will be crying in the streets. The system is broken. We are all destined for eternal darkness at the hands of an unfeeling red team. So, let's talk about computer security. So, let's, let's start with a fundamental truth. Humans have been failing since the dawn of time. Um, it took us a, a whole millennia to stop failing at trade. Um, it took us several hundred years to start using fire, and then a few hundred more to invent a group of people to specifically stop the types of people who failed so hard at making fire that they literally burnt the house down. And while the best way to get management excited about a disaster plan is to burn down the building across the street, I doubt corporate are going to be very happy when they come back to their office after driving their BMW in from their second holiday home in the Hamptons and find $200 worth of gas, fire lighters, and a slightly singed access control card. So, uh, let's talk for a moment about cars, uh, both the muse for some of America's greatest songs and nowadays basically metal computer boxes on wheels. Um, I bought a car about two years ago, and I decided that, the being me, the first thing I needed to do before driving it was to plug my laptop into it and see what was going on under the hood. Um, and what I found was both amazing and utterly horrifying. There are entire swathes of features that you can just enable. You can plug in extra buttons and have them do stuff. There's three cameras, 14 ultrasonic sensors, four radar units, two network switches, a SIM card. We'll get to that. Um, so. Quick crash course on car internals. 
Every modern car has multiple redundant computer networks within it, linking a whole ton of various modules together, from your instrument cluster to your aircon, systems that dynamically manage suspension and fuel injection timing, and the security systems for locking, unlocking, immobilization, all of that jazz. And the most critical ones that we have are the ECUs. These were originally introduced to help with fuel efficiency back in the 70s, but basically evolved into integral safety controls within the cars themselves. Um, and we now, unfortunately, live in a world where, when I say the word car keys, you might think of this, uh, but what I actually think, uh, what I mean, is a folder called car keys in the file system of your Tesla, which contains an RSA key pair to connect to the private VPN it talks to in order to inform benevolent car god Elon of your every movement. And that's a problem for many reasons. The most obvious being, you now have remotely networked access to your car's drivetrain. Which, if you think I'm joking about this, there's two very smart people by the name of Charlie Miller and Chris Valashek who actually were able to enable remote control of your car's engine, brakes, and other minor systems just by knowing your Jeep's public IP address. And you might say, oh, I didn't realize my Jeep had a public IP address. Well, you also might not be aware that your car may also have a SIM card and be connecting to the cell network just because. Um, fortunately, there was a patch for this. Um, and then we got a paper in January of last year, casually titled, Who Killed My Parked Car? Which casually dropped the bombshell that you can now do this shit even when the car's turned off. Which does not make anyone happy. Um, but at least modern car manufacturers care about maintaining overall security, right? Uh, well, um, so there was a leak a few years back from a former Tesla engineer whose NDA had expired, and he basically went ham uh, for legal reasons uh, the things I'm about to talk about are alleged, however, they do kind of line up with things that happened in the real world. Um, so, examples. They apparently run their entire backend on a single data center in the worst VMware deployment known to man, their quote, not mine. Uh, they had a Jenkins pipeline failure that caused the entire fleet to reboot for half an hour. Uh, they uploaded JSON remotely to the cars, which broke their JSON parser and caused every single car to boot loop, uh, with the only solution being to write a script to mass SSH into every car and RM the file. And you might be wondering, how could they SSH into all the cars? Well, every Tesla talks back to a central open VPN server, except for the time that all the open VPN certificates expired because they forgot to renew them, and they had to patch open uh, VPN certificate expiry out of the server so that the cars could reconnect so they could then push new certificates back out again. Then there's the time that they stored all their system logs in a single 700 terabyte MySQL database, um, and the, uh, well, no, 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 running on CentOS 5. Then there's the supercharger system, which uses a 2G simplex, um, as in, you know that little five, 4, 5G you get in the top of your phone? Go back like a couple of Gs, um, and that is what they're running for that, um, which means that updating them is a one kilobyte per second operation, meaning that to update it, it takes three days. And even Tencent uh, managed a couple of years ago to find the details of a Wi-Fi network that the car would just constantly look for and try and connect to and then leverage that into a WebKit exploit to be able to take over most of the car because for some reason at the time the infotainment system didn't have a gateway between the unfiltered CAN bus traffic in the car and the rest of it. Um, fortunately, this has all been patched, but ultimately with these things it's always the tip of the iceberg. And to make matters worse, uh, as of last week, they are apparently now shipping cars without USB ports, without telling people. So uh, if you thought your problem was that your car had too many ports, uh, it turns out it may not even have enough of them. Um, and that's the core problem, really. Um, too many damn sockets. Um, Literally everything has a socket nowadays, and thanks to the rise of the Internet of Things, we have a lot of stuff that is connected to the Internet that really shouldn't be. Um, and what we're doing now is we're starting to add these types of services uh, very ubiquitously into both our homes and our offices. And that is fundamentally like adding physical doors, right? Like you've got to have some of them to get in and out of your house, but the less the better because then you reduce the number of them that you have to lock. And it's not like we don't know how to do this. Back in the 60s, everyone was talking about how we were, people were worried that everyone was going to wiretap their homes. And now we're just like, hey, wiretap, can cats eat pancakes? 
Which now gets even better because there was a study on this that showed you can now use ultrasonic voice recordings to do this and these devices will still answer you. So instead of just shouting, hey Siri, open the front door, you can now really annoy the neighbor's dog while you do it. And the main point being that the more of these devices you have, the more doors you open up. Um, which, on top of them being bad from that perspective, is also awful when you realize that most of these systems are really only being checked from a security angle by the people who built them, which is kind of like bees hiring Winnie the Pooh to consult on honey security issues. Um, it's going to end badly. So, let me give you a real-life example of why the Internet of Things is potentially going to kill us all. So, there's a particular brand of smart light bulb, which is configurable via smartphone. So your phone uses Wi-Fi to send a command to that first bulb, and it then forwards all of those commands to the rest of them over a local wireless mesh network. So you can use Wireshark to analyze the packets going across that mesh network. Um, in case you missed that last sentence, you can analyze the packet data being sent by light bulbs. This, this should not be a thing. Um, so anyway, you sniff the traffic, you, you quickly figure out that the light bulbs go around um, exchanging your Wi-Fi password, um, which is okay. So you might think that you can sniff that network and uh, get the Wi-Fi password. However, the light bulbs exchange that password in an encrypted form, except you can reverse engineer the light bulbs firmware, which is a second statement, which I have no problem with. Um, like, you can, you can, like, you can, this thing just gives up the ghost. It's like, you got me. Here's my firmware version, the Wi Fi password, and my mother's maiden serial number. Um, and you, you quickly figure out that all of this is mostly okay because they're encrypting the Wi Fi password. Except, um, they're using the exact same key baked into the firmware for every single uh, encryption operation, meaning that if you extract the key once, you can now decrypt the networks of every single house that uses this particular brand of smart light bulb. Which means that we are now, if you leverage that, inside the wireless network, and we can now hop to things like IP cams, because we are now in your network via LNS, or light bulb network insertion. And at this point, things really start to get fun. Um, so. Right, this is an absolute beauty. Okay, audience participation time. You see that green light up at the top there? What do you think that means? Cool, yeah, it's not on. Um, you're completely and utterly wrong. It is not tied to power. It is not indicative of the actual state of the camera. Um, and uh, while it is turned off, that just turns off the LED. It still keeps recording, but according to the manufacturer, it doesn't send any video to the internet. And I would go into why the 10,000 reasons why you really shouldn't trust the manufacturer to tell you that, but frankly, that ship has sailed, come back to port, been vigorously shot at, sunk, dredged back up, and sailed again. Yeah. And if you thought that was misleading, I would like to introduce you to the only thing that I think is more misleading, which is this, the peacock mantis shrimp, which is not a peacock, a mantis, or a bloody shrimp. And that's not the only example of people screwing up firmware in recent memory. Um, Nintendo have had a couple of really fun goes at this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the security model of embedded devices for a moment. So boot ROMs, uh, which we're going to be talking about here, are the first code that you ever run on a modern piece of consumer hardware. It validates that everything else you're about to run is allowed to run. And it's generally physically burned into the chip so that it can never be updated. Because if you can update your boot ROM, you can also remove all the security checks. Um, and what I've described there would generally be referred to as level one boot ROM. There's also level two boot ROM, which tends to have more checks, but is also updatable. So if you find an issue with it, you can then update. You can use the level one boot ROM to patch the level two and everything's happy. Um, Nintendo, however, aren't exactly the smartest cookies in the jar with boot ROM. Um, on the Wii, they decided that instead of implementing an actual random number generator, they would basically just do this. Um, and then, not to be outdone, uh, they came back again with the Switch. Um, and this had an interesting exploit in the uh, processor where if you were able to get it into recovery mode, you could then just start arbitrarily dumping memory out of it which is great, um, and also putting code back in, allowing you to then execute stuff uh, that was not, uh, not, not signed. Um, and 
the hardest part of this at the time was forcing the thing into recovery mode. Um, at the time, you had to sort of like open the back of it and kind of probe around like some insane like open heart surgery on a switch. Um, and at some point, you would find the right pins and it would be great. Um, until someone figured out that uh, the Joy-Con pins on the side of the device, you can just short two of them together. And then it immediately goes cool and drops itself into recovery mode, uh, which meant that within about 15 minutes of this discovery being made, people were selling a piece of plastic that you can just push into the side of it and magically start running code, which is great. Um, speaking of accidentally failing so hard that you destroy your life's work, uh, let's talk about Uzbekistan, uh, a country that you think about so infrequently that an article entitled Eight Reasons to Go to Uzbekistan contains such gems to entice you in as there are hardly any tourists and the existence of vodka. And Uzbekistan is a really great example of a Soviet spin-off country with a repressive and much feared intelligence agency called the State Security Service. And they have spectacularly bad OPSEC. Um, this, by the way, is their former head who was recently sentenced to 18 years in prison on charges including bribery, extortion, and forming a criminal enterprise. So clearly run by great people. And they are bad at almost everything they do, from basic intelligence to keeping anything they've ever done a secret. Uh, they're so good that they set the who is information on a domain they use to control their malware to the address of their super secret military installation. Their class. But up until recently, nobody had ever really heard of them. No one really thought that Uzbekistan had a cyber capability when it came to warfare. And then Kaspersky happened. Kaspersky discovered they were suddenly getting a lot of reports of targeted attacks originating from a group calling themselves Sandcat. Um, that, by the way, is a Sandcat. They are lovely. Um, and Sandcat, um, which now has a laptop, um, appeared to be the SSS's sort of internal malware and offensive capabilities division. And they were pretty well kitted out. They were buying stuff from people like NSO and Kandiru. They were using malware that had originally been popularized in the UAE. They, they knew their stuff. Um, and Kaspersky discovered that Sandcat's developers had installed antivirus on their development machines uh, to test whether the malware they were developing could bypass ma malware detection. Um, except they were using it with the telemetry reporting feature enabled, which means that whenever it finds something uh, odd, it sends it back to Kaspersky for analysis. So better than that, Every time their suppliers would send them any new exploits for analysis, they arrived on a thumb drive, which they would plug into their machines. The Kaspersky would then automatically scan it for malware and then grab all the files that it thought was malicious. So in several instances, Kaspersky actually had their hands on zero days before they were ever able to use them. Um, yeah, so they, oh yeah, they also, um, somehow managed to include screenshots of their own desktop in test files that they included in the malware builds, which meant that Kaspersky was then able to not only look at their desktop layouts, but also uh, figure out that all the developer notes were written in Uzbek, uh, which is a bit of a, uh, bit of a difficult one to try and um, avoid the uh, attribution on that, and also shows that the interface used to track and control the malware, um, including all of the IP addresses for their test machines, which meant that they could then go back and find all of the test machines. Um, and find basically every installation of this stuff. Um, and at this point, I have to imagine that the Kaspersky lot were just sort of drinking into their liver transplants while watching all of this go down. Um, and finally, after a bit, they realize what's happening and it peters off. But they burned through hundreds of millions of dollars worth of exploits to do this and exploited this adorable cat's name, which is frankly indefensible to me. And this, this is... This is why you should never install antivirus as a malware developer. Oh my god, I can't believe I have to say that. Um, right, topic of further education. We're going to open a few doors. Uh, namely, every door in this airport, um, a whole bunch of hospitals, and every single branch of US Bancor. Uh, because the thing that all these buildings have in common, besides them being parts of a giant game of corporate monopoly, is that they all use a company called HID for access control. And HID are everywhere. If you've ever been inside an airport, um, university campus, hospital, um, you have probably seen one of their brand of card readers at some point standing guard over a restricted area. 
And each one of these card readers runs all the way back to a lovely box called a door controller. And that controls all the functions of the door, including locking, unlocking, schedules, alarms, etc. And in order for these controllers to be easily integrated into existing setups, they have a network service called Discovery D built in. So your management software sends out a UDP discovery broadcast, and all the door controllers in the network will respond with some lovely information, like their MAC address and their firmware version and even a common name. Thing is, while it's only supposed to do that, it also has a couple of undocumented features. Um, specifically, the one that allows you to change the blink pattern on the controller. And this is accomplished by sending a command blink on packet with the number of times you want it to blink. And it then builds up a path to mount apps bin blink and then calls system to run the blink command with that number as an argument. Um, okay, pop quiz. Who can tell me the glaring problem with arbitrarily calling system? Yeah, uh, no sanitization on the user input here, so if you send a Linux command wrapped in backticks, it gets executed as root, which means that with a few simple UDP packets and no authentication whatsoever, you can permanently unlock any door connected to the controller, and you can do it in a way that makes it impossible for the remote management system to unlock it. Um, on top of that, because this is broadcast UDP we're talking about, you can do this to every single door on the network at the same time. So now at this point, I'm considering buying stock in single malt whiskey distilleries. And then I come across this doozy. This is the TP-Link travel router. Um, 3 or 4G compatible, configurable over SMS. Um, why? I have no idea, because you still have to be within Wi-Fi range to use it, and who wants to receive text messages to a router? Um, and it has a relatively simple configuration uh, setup. You text it and it goes, cool, and you, you can ask it, okay, cool, I'm authenticated now, what's the password, and it goes, cool, um, and then you text it arbitrary JavaScript, and it executes it, for reasons. Um, yeah, so you can basically just write a piece of JavaScript that uh, grabs a bunch of variables out of the web interface for it, um, and then texts them back to you. Um, because the text ability is available in the JavaScript APIs for this thing for some reason. Um, so, yeah, if you ever find one of these in the, in the wild, then please do let me know, because they horrify me. Um, but if you thought this is the end, you graphically underestimate the internet. Um, all right, quick fire round. Um, did you know that touring speakers have web servers? This one does. Um, additionally, you can just send it an MP3, and it will play it. That couldn't possibly go wrong. Um, one of my personal favorites found uh, by Dan Tentler a couple of years back was a cow milking machine connected to the open internet, which gets even more disturbing when you zoom in and find that it has a horse setting. <laughs> here's a ticket barrier I found in Amsterdam with a Linux shell on it. Um, here's a bunch of IoT connected teddy bears that casually had 820,000 users and every voice message that a child had ever recorded into the thing leak onto the internet. Here's the world's most sociable shoe, the sole product of its kind. Or at least it was until Qualcomm patented it. Um, here's an HDMI cable with built-in antivirus. Here's a Linux stack trace on a faucet. Um, here, oh god, I love this one so much. Okay, so uh, imagine you are a um, you are a casino, and you are building an incredibly high-security environment for all of your stuff, and then you connect your fish tank to the internet. And your fish tank is subsequently used to, as effectively as a direct proxy into your secure networks, uh, to then go around and steal, I think, something like $80 million or something. Um, my, this is just my favorite quote of, of any article I've read ever. Somebody got into the fish tank and used it to move around into other areas of the network um, and send out data. Great. Um, yeah, did you know that the dot .bank domain apparently uh, has stronger encryption? To me. Um, so, what if I told you it gets even better? Um, weirdly, what if I told you that Morpheus never actually says what if I told you in any of the Matrix films? Watch them back sometime. That will weird you out. Um, so, let's talk about printers. Printers are fucking terrible, elder god-like manifestations of years of horrible engineering decisions tied together with nothing but postscript and glue. 
So Postscript or Adobe Postscript, because as we know, nothing bad has ever come out of Adobe, um, is a VM executed language that printers use in order to print things um, and execute arbitrary code and kill God in that order. Um, they are the kind of lovely language, it's the kind of lovely language that has vulnerabilities described as being presumably present in every Postscript printer for the last 32 years. Um, it allows for literal remote, ex remote code execution and the ability to pull any print job ever run through it. Because yes, your printer will store things you print through it for indeterminate amounts of time. And no, you cannot find out where that is unless you breach your own printer. You may have heard of the great PewDiePie printer hack, a phrase I never thought I would have to say in my life. Um, the gist of this is that there were a couple of people who saw there were hundreds of thousands of printers connected to the public internet and thought, what if we send all of these a postscript file where you just print a page asking people to subscribe to a Swedish YouTuber? And it worked to the tune of about 50,000 printers. Um, up to and including label printers. Um, and then, because nobody learns from this stuff, they did it again and managed to double their attack surface from 50 to 100,000. The other great thing when Postscript goes wrong is that it goes wrong hard. Like sometimes it prints the debug log across your entire document. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't even care enough to do that and just prints the stack trace. Like this is the proper old school stuff where calling the print function would just automatically stop burning trees. God knows what happened here. Um, ask not for whom the ball tolls. It tolls for Dogman, apparently. Um, I have to assume really this, this may not be a printing error, but it might just be a legitimate cry for help. So let's talk trains, um, because we are going to use buffer overflows to make a train disappear. Um, OK, technically, we're not using buffer overflows, but I thought the pun was worth it. Um, so let's clarify a little. We are going to make a train disappear from the signaling network, which is arguably far more dangerous. And in order to explain how this works, we first have to understand how integer overflow works. Um, and in simple terms, you can think of it like a, a car odometer. Um, computers operate using registries, which have limited amounts of space. And if you give them more than their maximum, they will do one of two things. It will either saturate, where it simply sets the registry to the maximum value as a failsafe, or it will wrap, where the next increment above the maximum sets off a chain of carry-on additions, uh, except danger will Robinson danger, because that red bit is outside the bit we're reading, which means that when it combines these two, it actually sees this. That's critical. We just took three eggs. We threw together those eggs, and we've ended up with zero eggs, um, which is fine. And now I'm going to have to rephrase that, because when I said that was fine, I meant I was on the verge of setting myself on fire, because this also applies to train signaling systems. Um, one of the main ways that they operate is with these things called axle counters. And like the name implies, they count the number of axles on a train as it passes by. Usually, you get one at the entrance and one at the exit. And in order to determine whether your line is clear, it compares the amount of axles going in to the amount of axles going out. Um, and then the other few things to determine the, uh, the, the setup of it. However, uh, some of the older equipment is built using 8-bit microcontrollers, meaning if you have a train with more than 255 axles, it will disappear completely as soon as it clears the axle counter. Yeah, um, the total, I, I love this, in the, uh, this is, I think, the Swiss uh, documentation. You, I don't think you're legally allowed to actually build a train with 256 axles um, for this specific reason. <laughs> um, and as you can imagine, the ramifications of that can be relatively problematic. Um, so, uh, on to a lighter topic. Let's talk about time travel. Um, specifically, we are going to make this phone think that it is traveling through time so hard that it is going to just lose its mind. Um, so, the way that phones, and basically every other device, knows what, it's, what the current time is, is with a protocol called NTP. And the way this works is that it synchronizes the time on a server with some sort of accurate clock connected to it to uh, to your device over the network. And the problem is, back in April of 2018, I think, um, there was a pretty severe bug in iOS, one that would completely brick your phone if you set the date to January 1st, 1970. A um, couple of theories as to why, ranging from integer underflow to iOS code signing just refusing to load the operating system because the certificate start date would be after. Um, but regardless, it was quite bad because the only way to really fix it was to force a firmware update. Um, and this was compounded by the fact um, that the way that this normally works is that it goes off, it asks what the time is, and it gets the time back. Except until a second patch came in, you could spoof time.apple.com's DNS on your Wi-Fi network, 
and then point it at your own server, and then simply serve every device that connected to it a lovely new date. Um, and suddenly you now have a router which gets to play the role of the Apple Grim Reaper. But, so, why, why does any of this really matter? Well, the ultimate point here is that there is basically no environment in which you will not find some sort of security requirement or security vulnerability. And we need to think very carefully about the design of not just the things we build, but of the things around us. Because, especially in environments like these, we are very much the arbiters of a lot of this. Most non-technical people are not going to be able to decompile a light bulb or pen test door controller. There's a very, very special level of responsibility assigned to us as people who design and understand these types of systems to take the initiative to pry and crowbar our way in to make sure that things are acting the way we think they are. And all of this is because some people wrote bad code. Now, bad code can be kind of subjective. Uh, for example, this is the output of a neural network designed to generate plausible sounding food. Um, this, to me, sounds very much like the instructions for new bean and mustard chocolate flavored dessert soylent, and the idea of completely meat chocolate pie is completely insane. And, you know, after going after the obvious solutions, let's ultimately advocate for these things regardless of where we are in the industry. Desi look at what you're designing. Take a look at the items in your house, in your office. Educate both yourselves and the people around you to these risks. Um, hopefully, I've showed you a few examples of the more unusual ways these things can go wrong, but much of the time, it's the far more common instances that cause a majority of the damage. Um, and ultimately, there are a lot of very easy ways to de-risk de de yourself and your privacy and the people around you. Um, like, if your friends bought a ton of IoT stuff, talk to them about network security. If they bought a Tesla, talk to them about making better life decisions. There's nothing that I can really love more than someone who is willing to actually poke under the hood of this stuff in the name of making it better. And if this talk can convince one more person that reverse engineering is not some kind of black art that takes years of training, that network security is not just having the infrastructure people do it, um, and that really, you can do 90% of the security with 10% of the effort as long as we have someone in the right place who cares. Um, and also the fact that most people that are out to get to you are usually um, not, in fact, hoodies wearing binary. Um, uh, and that also most of your risks are not going to be this obvious. Uh, most of the time, it's looking more like your flashlight app requiring access to your microphone's photo and call history. Plus, if the whole security thing doesn't work out, at least I still have a job setting swimming pools on fire. So, um, if I have to leave you with one thing, I will let it just be this. Uh, if you're ever having a bad day, just remember that Xerox sold photocopiers for eight years that would just randomly change numbers in the documents they scanned. You will never do worse than that. So, thank you very, very much for your time, uh, and, well, good night.